Hello, my name is Matthew. I'm an engineer here at Hockridge Systems. In this third video of our Airbox design series, we'll be going over how we set up our flow simulation for our initial design and how we could quickly apply these parameters to other configurations of our Airbox. This ability to quickly copy our simulation to other configurations allows us to rapidly test and confirm how our design changes affects the airflow throughout our Airbox. With these results, we can move on to printing our ideal model. Now, continuing on from our first video, we have our airbox modeled around our referenced features and bodies separated from one another. Before we can run our simulation for the airflow in the box, we'll have to first remove all reference bodies from our feature tree list and close off the airbox using the move bodies command. Using the delete bodies tool, we can select on everything besides what we want to include in our flow sim to be removed so it doesn't affect any part of our study. Then, with move bodies, we can mate the lids and spacers to the airbox itself so we have a watertight seal. Along with ensuring our airbox assembly is watertight through the move bodies command, we'll also have to add in lids to any open spots where the airflow comes in and out of our airbox. These lids are what we can apply our conditions to for our sim study and are needed for internal flow simulation studies. In our simulation tab, there is a tool to create these lids by selecting on surfaces where our open holes are. Another option, however, and the one done for this case study, was to create extruded features to cover the holes using sketch entities created from the surface. Either way, once the unnecessary bodies have been removed from the assembly and our model is watertight through the lids, we can begin setting up our flow simulation using the wizards. This wizard will guide you through creating the study's outline, such as the units, what we're trying to test for and with, the external factors to account for, and so on. We'll select mainly default options for our units and have the analysis be internal with gravity force applied in our z-direction. We'll also be selecting air for our tested particle and default thermal properties throughout our entire study. After a quick setup process runs, we'll see a new tab in our feature tree with our simulation study parameters and configuration listed. One thing that can be done at this time to ensure our simulation will run is to check our fluid volume in the assembly. If our assembly is watertight, we'll see that the internal space of our airbox turns blue in a message saying that our geometry is okay. Turning the parts transparent may help with seeing any internal volumes as well as any spaces that are highlighted from the check found as a failure. Now on to setting up the parameters of our study. If we look at the global mesh cells, we can see that the cell squares are fairly large. For the most part of the space, that is fine, but for areas that the air will be flowing out, we may want to increase the density of our cells to see how the air changes around the velocity stacks. By using the local mesh setting, we can select on key surfaces that we want our study to refine the cells on, allowing us to see more subtle changes to the particle flow around them. Next, we'll add our boundary conditions, which will define the parameters of our study at the start and end of our airflow. For the spot where our air will be flowing into the box, we'll choose an environmental pressure for our condition type, and that the goals are to calculate this area's volume flow and velocity average. Since the air will be flowing inwards, we'll also need to ensure that our surface selection reflects that. We'll set up another boundary condition for the outlets of our assembly. This time choosing a outlet flow volume for our type and selecting on the back face of each of these lids. For the flow parameters on these outlets, we found this by using the bike's manual to calculate the values that, that these outlets should be flowing at. We'll also set up new goals to be calculated for these outlet conditions, such as volume and velocity average. With our conditions and mesh settings prepped, we can run our first study. Clicking on Run will begin the study and a new window will appear telling us how the study has progressed. Before minimizing this window, it's recommended to check the total cells number to make sure that it isn't an exceedingly big or small number. 190,000 is a good middle number, whereas maybe less than 1,000 would be too small and greater than 400,000 would take way too long to process. With our simulation done, I added some ways to view our study via the cut plots tool to see cells along certain areas of our assembly and the flow trajectory to see how the air is flowing throughout the airbox. 
The flow trajectory is our key tool to let us know how the air is moving inside of the air box, which is what we're really looking for in these studies. By using the trajectories tool, we can see how the air is being trapped and folding back into the air box and find areas that can be redesigned. Since we've created our base study at this point, we can now save time in repeating the study on other designs by using the clone option. If you right click the study we just ran, choosing clone allows you to rename it into something a little bit different and apply it to another configuration. In the real world, we won't have all four of these valves opened at once. It really would be only two at a time. In the second study, we'll just edit our conditions and remove two of the outflow lids, which mimics them being closed off. Rerunning our study now, we can see how the flow trajectories have been affected by only having two valves open. We can quickly switch between our two studies as well to see how the two flows compare to one another. When it comes to applying studies to other configurations, it's just as easy. Configurations let you quickly switch between multiple features to be suppressed and unsuppressed in our model, essentially making derived versions of our initial one. We have two other configurations in our list currently. The one I'm selecting adds an internal rib to the air box and adjusts the lid to have a cutout. Once the configuration is enabled, we can go back into our simulation feature tree tab. We can clone our one in three valve simulation to this configuration. Once confirmed, we can see all of our conditions, goals, and result viewers are copied and we have a new dropdown in our projects reflecting our study and this configuration. Before running the study on the new configuration, we can also confirm that the airbox is still watertight by going into the check geometry tab and finding the fluid volume. If it's successful, we're good to go with our new study. When done, we can view our results just like before and see how these new internal features affect the flow. By repeating these steps for other configurations created for the airbox, our design can be refined little by little until we achieve an ideal version to print. By utilizing configurations in our modeling workflow and the cloning capabilities of SOLIDWORKS simulation, there is very little downtime between getting our design made and the simulation started. All these clone studies can have their own settings adjusted independently from one another too, in case there is a design that requires a different local mesh refinement or conditions. Thank you for watching the third video in our Airbox case series. If you're interested in following along with these videos or interested in other SOLIDWORKS, printing, and scanning technologies, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more information.